Star Wars, The Heart of the Jedi, by Kenneth C. Flint. Chapter 27 A turbo laser bolt burst against the outer wall of the Jedi Temple. It came from one of two squat portable weapons that had been set up near the wall. Crews of specially armored stormtroopers were directing individual shots against the stone under the direction of General Kantos. He stepped up to examine the wall after the last shot. It was seemingly constructed of ordinary rock, no slightest chip or scorch mark indicated that the massive energy impact had an effect. He shook his head and stepped back to the crew. Still nothing. Try a bit higher, he instructed, and boost the power. Down on the shore, standing below the looming head of the ATAT -AT swimmer, Tharkas watched the work with Luke and the being called Pollux. A dozen more stormtroopers stood around the young Jedi with ready guns. The High Admiral was taking no chances. I can't believe you were the Ewok, a still-dazed Luke said to the blue-tinged being. And a Jawa, and a warrior of the Sand People, and even one of your own pilots, the strange man added to some glee. Oh, it's all manner of things. I've become in my pursuit of you. Quite a challenge you were, one of the best I've had. There was another explosion at the temple as a new laser bolt went home. Shapeshifter. Luke examined the translucent skin with its visible arteries, and the purple mass of the heart pumping within the narrow chest. I've known one of your kind before. Perhaps, but I doubt you've met the Dios Dioscoroi. Oh, whoops, that was Tharkas. Perhaps, but I doubt you've met the Dor Dioscoroi, Tharkas commented. Very rare, though very useful being they've been to me over the years. Never so much as now. What happened to Captain Thatch? Luke asked Pollux. Or was there ever one? Alas, yes, poor fellow, Pollux said with mock regret. I desperately needed a way to follow you from Tatooine. I was afraid I'd lose you then. You were in such a hurry to get a ship and leave. Too reckless, Luke muttered with himself. Yoda was right. What was that? asked the being, not clearly hearing this. I say I was foolhardy to do it that way, Luke told him, rushing off alone. But it tur turned out well for me, Paul exploded. While well, you waited for your sporter to be prepped, I hunted swiftly through the port for some way to follow. Then the salvage ship with its droid crew popped up. It was ideal. I realized I could stay with you best by having you with, by having you with me. So I took on the Jawa's guys to sabotage your ship. I'm expert in that. I then used the scow to rescue you, all quite easy. My master stroke was to, to make Thatch an Ewok. He wasn't one? No, humanoid like you. But of course, a nasty type, not suitable at all. I had to gain your trust at once, you see. I thought what creature more lovable, more helpful, more sincere than a furry little Ewok. Especially for you, their friend. And it worked. A fine role for me, he added pridefully. One of the best impersonations I've ever done. Diabolical, isn't he? Said a pleased Tharkis. A turbo laser fired again. The sound of the explosion was yet louder. This time Kantos cranked up the weapon's power. But I don't understand why you destroyed that patrol ship, said Luke. You wiped out hundreds of your own men. A necessary sacrifice, the being said dismissingly. You see, I was actually the one who signaled them to stop us. I had to secure your fullest trust to ensure that you would let me bring you on here. He grinned. What better way to prove my loyalty to you? The noble little Ewok ri the noble little Ewok risking himself to fight the Empire. Then you're a murderer, Luke said in revulsion. I'm a soldier, Pollux retorted. I do what I have to do to win. That is the only rule in war. So I suppose all the other beings you've impersonated have all died too. Oh, not always. Only when I've had to assume an existing identity. And don't be too disgusted by my ability, Jedi. He added indignantly. It saved you several times. Without that man in the Moss Eisley bar, the troopers would have had you. Without that most accommodating Bantha, you would have lost your head. The Bantha? That was you too? As I told you. Darkus said. The devious talents of these beings are immeasurable. Oh, whoops, Darkus. As I told you, said. 
The devious talents of these beings are immeasurable. He even managed a way to slow you down so that we could beat you here. A much louder blast drew all the eyes back to the line. Ah, said the High Admiral. They're upping the power yet more. They should break through very soon. He looked to Luke. It seems we've no more use for you, Jedi. Are you so sure it'll be that easy? Luke challenged. Of course, Darkus answered. This one obstacle can't stop us now. The Force will soon cease to aid the Alliance, and so will you. What then? Then I will take delight in crushing your so-called New Republic and making the Empire the sole power in the galaxy again. With yourself as the new Emperor? Luke shrewdly guessed. Darkus eyed him piercingly. Why not? He boldly said. Once I had no such grand ambition for myself, but the idea has been growing stronger as I've grown closer to success. Twin blasts hit the wall this time. As both turbo lasers fired, Lantos went to examine the effect. He then strode down to join them on the beach. I don't know what the wall's made of, told Darkus, but those turbo lasers, lasers don't have the power to break through. Recommendations, snapped the High Admiral. That we try the bigger guns on the submersible. Very well, said Darkus. See it done. Santos went up a ramp, lowered from the bottom of the machine's head section, vanishing inside. Soon after the huge guns thrusting out over Luke and the others shifted position to bear, to bear squarely on the wall. The troopers, still before the section, hastily moved themselves and the portable guns out of the way. One of the big turbo lasers fired. Its powerful bolt flashed in, struck the wall, and simply bounced away. It ricocheted nearly straight back toward its source, slamming into the beach not far from the machine. Those gathered before it were showered with sand as the impact dug a wide crater. Tanto spoke his head out of the hatch, looking a bit sheepish. Uh, sorry, High Admiral, he said contritely. Never mind that. Arcus wrapped out from frustration. Was the turbo laser at the highest power setting? Uh, yes, sir. It appears the wall has some type of force shield capable of deflecting even full energy bolts. Darkus contemplated the temple. Then never mind the wall. We'll go in from above. Send up a fighter to scout the way. In moments, a large door was sliding open at the apex of the submersible, submersible's metal shell. The TIE fighter was lifted up by its repulsive lift drive from the bay beneath. When high enough, it activated main engines and screamed away. It soared around and over the temple several times in examination. Finally, it stopped, hovered a moment, and dropped slowly down towards the interior. But some twenty feet above the temple's wall, the ship suddenly rebounded as if from a solid surface. The ship bounced back upward, momentarily out of control. The pilot recovered, lifted, flew around to another spot, and tried again. With the same result. The next time, at the High Admiral's command, the TIE fighter strafed the temple several times from above. The shower of la laser bolts was deflected by an inv invisible barrier in every place tested. Another energy shield of some kind, Marcus growled. I guess it won't be so easy, after all, Luke said with a smile. Just drew Tharkis's hard gaze to the young man. It seems we still need you, after all, he said darkly. For what? he asked. To take us in, of course. Luke laughed outright. You really think I'll help you? I think you will. Eventually, Darkus said in an ominous way. It just takes the correct persuasion. He signaled the stormtroopers. Seize him, he brusquely ordered. The soldiers swiftly closed in around Luke. The Millennium Falcon came into the planet's atmosphere on the far side of the orbiting Star Destroyer. It shot straight down and turned to skim close above the water, all but slicing through the crests. I only got a quick look before we ducked out of sight, explained Han, now piping the ship across the wave tops. I think there was some kind of landing party on the south side of that island. So we come in from the north and hope they don't notice us. Sounds risky, said Leia. Got a better choice, he countered. She shook her head. Around the watery curve of the planet, the Falcon soared at high speed finally picking up the line of land ahead. He slowed as they approached it. Here, the shoreline was uniformly steep. He flew on in, dropping the ship down on the rocky ground beneath. The landing ramp dropped and Han ventured out, blaster in hand. An armed Leia followed. They looked carefully around. There was only the barren island 
the empty sea, and the temple's high wall inland. Looks safe enough, he said. Of course it is, she said. They're there. We're here. The question is, how do we get there? Walk, he suggested. All those miles around, on this ground? Do you know how many hours that would take? If they've got Luke, he may not have the time. Would you just prefer taking the Falcon in and warning them we're coming? Surprise is our only chance. I know, she said in exasperation. But there must be some other way. A clattering noise from the water drew their attention to it. A sleek, bottle-nosed head was thrust above the waves, moving excitedly. Oh, looks like there's life here after all, Han said. Big fish, what's it doing? I... I think it's trying to speak to us, she said. It's almost as if... I can hear words in my head. As some kind of telepath, then. Yes, it's got to, it's got something to do with the Force here. I can tell that much. I think it creates some kind of mental link between those tuned to it. But my skills aren't strong enough. The voice is too faint and far away to understand. It said, Hello, welcome to Angorathea, said another voice from behind them. They turned back to the ship to see C-3PO coming down the ramp. The droid had been reassembled and was walking again, if even a bit more stiffly than usual. Chewie accompanied him. 3 po Leia said with delight. They're together again. Can you understand what it said? Certainly. I am fluent in over six million forms of communication, it droned mechanically. This speech is a variation of that used by the great Weyladons of Iskalon. Sorry said Leia, her momentary joy fading at the impersonal sound of the voice. I forgot, he's only a walking computer now. For a second. Never mind, said Han as Chewie helped the droid out over the rough ground to them. He's still useful to us. 3PO, talk to the fish. Ask if it knows anything about Luke Skywalker. But before the droid could ask, the teacher uh, gave vent to a long, empathic speech. It says I have no need to convey your words to her. 3PO translated. She can understand your speech and knows we are friends, as she can sense the force in the Princess Leia and somewhat read her thoughts. She understands you are Luke Skywalker's sister and offers its help. A ah, pretty smart fish, Han said impressed. Then does it... She began to the droid, then turned to the creature. I mean, do you know where Luke is? The telepath gave another long reply. She says that a large metal monster filled with beings of both black and white have seized him on the opposite side of the island, the droid passed on. Damn, said Han. So the Empire's already got him. This being herself did not see him, Ripio continued to translate, but does know what happened. It shares a collective conscience with the rest of its species. All are one with the Force. What's going on here? This came from Gowen. He and Valadian were now out of the ship and approaching the rest. The younger man had looked at the creature with a raised eyebrow. What is it? he asked uncertainly. The being chattered a reply. This is a she, sir, the droid informed him, not an it. She says that she is of the Lazuan. Ah, uh, so the being speaks, said Valadian. And she's... And she's smarter than Gowan, Han added drawing a glare from the prince. She's already told us that Luke is a captive on the island's far side, said Leia. Yeah, said Han. We gotta get around there and rescue him. Great, said Leia, except we still don't know how. The sea creature chattered away again. She says that perhaps her tribe can help us, the droid translated. How? asked Han. Can they fight? She responded. They have always been a peaceful race. 3PO explained. They have no weapons, nor any intention to use violence. Still, they are willing to do what they can. Okay, like what? For one thing, they can move very much faster by sea than you can by land. They might carry you around to a point near the Imperial Force. Carry? Han repeated skeptically. You mean we ride on their backs or something? We could do it, said Leia. You could do it. Gowen told her. Not me. She looked at him, then the realization hit her. You're frightened, aren't you? Me, he said blusteringly. Then he hesitated and sighed. So I am, 
admitted. I mean, well, I, I can't swim, okay? She suppressed a smile, saying with assurance. Believe me, I understand that. But I don't think they'll let you drown. Maybe not, but what about your droid? He countered. He probably can't take the water. And then there's the senator. It would take a herd of the Lazwan to keep the Wookiee afloat. He may be right in what he says, said Invaladian. Although I hate to admit it, I'm not as strong as I once was. The creature chattered away once again. She asks if you have any type of device which might support you safely upon the waters, said the droid. Huh? said Han. She means a boat, Leia supplied. He shrugged. Sure, we got a couple little inflatable rafts, but they're just fl for flotation purposes if we have to ditch on water. No motors or anything. The sea creature responded enthusiastically to that. She says that will be satisfactory, said the droid, so long as you also have some means for pulling them. Chewie, get some rope, Han ordered. Go on, you help me with the rafts. He turned for the ship. Behind him, the being spoke again. Oh, and Master Solo, the droid called after him. He looked back. Yeah? She says to tell you that she is not a fish. Woo-wee! Han said exuberantly as a blast of spray hit him across the face. It's like that one time I rode the sea dragons of Drexel. Invigorating, ain't it? Wet is what it is, Gowen said miserably. The two men and Leia sat in one of the two small inflatable boats. She sat up front with Han, also seeming to enjoy the ride, while Gowen cowered behind. Beside them, a second raft held Valadian, Chewie, and the droid. Both rafts were being drawn along at a very brisk clip, skimming across the waves. Their propulsion came from some fifty of the sleek, powerful sea beings, who held onto ropes with their mouths to drag the craft along. I had a speedboat on Tagoria once, Han said. Never went so fast as this. They slammed across a high crest. Water splashed into the boat. I'm getting wetter, Gowen complained. Hang on, Chewie, Han called to the other boat. Be sure that the professor doesn't bounce out. The Wookiee took a tighter grip on the droid beside him. The lady and seemed to be enjoying the ride as well. I haven't had so much fresh air in ages, the senator called back. They sped on around the curved coast of the island for some time, uh, before the creature's pace slowed and they turned in. Not long after, the inflatable boats were bumping against the rocky shore. Several of the obliging beings held the boats in place with their noses, while the passengers clambered onto the land. Chewie hauled 3PO out bodily and set him upright. One of the creatures made a long speech to them. He says that the Imperial force is not far ahead, the droid reported. We must be careful from here. They will stay about to watch and render assistance if they can. He? said Han. That's not the same one as before? No, Master, 3PO told him. But it doesn't matter. Their minds are all interconnected, as I said. Well, thanks, Han said to the creature. Although I don't know what else you can do to help. It made a reply. He says that you might wish to hurry, sir, said 3PO. It appears Master Skywalker may be in some distress. Han turned to his companions. All right, folks, looks like this is it, said grimly. Move on and scout out the situation. Everybody got their weapon? All save the droid showed him a blaster. Go in, most reluctantly. Let's go. As they started away, the sea being submerged and vanished. The odd little band of would-be rescuers was left alone to make its way through the rocky coast. When they caught first sight of the Imperial Swimmer looming from the sea, they went prone amidst the rocks, crawled forward cautiously to where they could observe the beach. Below the head of the metal monster was a large-sized group. A solid ring of stormtroopers enclosed a circular area. Inside it were some black uniformed men. One of them a pudgy, elderly man with grey goatee and thinning hair, was attaching wires from a squat machine to the extremities of a figure hung suspended between two poles. The figure was Luke Skywalker. Oh no, gasped Leia. What are they doing to him? Mind to transmogrify, the voice of 3PO droned, his round eye fixed on the familiar form attached to the wires. The doctor there is very good at that. We have to stop it, Leia said anxiously. I can feel Luke's rising anxiety. Strategy first, sweetheart, Han told him. You can't just charge into a hundred of them. Why don't you and Gowen in the center try to get around and open fire from the other side? 
Chewie and I'll sneak in and get him. Simple. Not a good idea, Gowan said with conviction. It can't work. You're an expert now? Han asked him. Why can it? Gowan shifted his blaster's muzzle to touch the side of Leia's head. Because if any of you try anything at all, I'm afraid I will have to shoot her, he told them.